Um, welcome to this event to discuss the Wilson Economics Prize. And welcome to Clifford Chance. I should um, start, in fact, by thanking Clifford Chance for allowing us to meet in such incredibly um, stylish uh, surroundings. Very kind of them. I should probably also say as well that they have absolutely no position on any of these uh, matters in hand. So, very kind of them meant to let us use their room. So why, why um, the uh, Wilson Economics Prize? Um, well, when you have a, a big problem, sometimes you need to come up with a, a big incentive to find a solution, and that's what we're doing with this prize. Uh, it's certainly topical. When we were discussing doing this a while ago, we wondered, uh, you know, what would people make of it? But I think it's interesting to see how many people have been interested in this prize and how many people are, are out there already thinking about these incredibly important questions. So. This evening's uh, session is really intended to give you a sense of um, uh, how the prize works and also to sort of whet your appetite and uh, have a discussion of um, what's going on in Europe at the moment that will make you want to all get your applications in before the end of the prize. I should start by explaining why it's called the Wilson Prize. And it's very kindly sponsored by one of our trustees at Policy Exchange. Policy Exchange is a think tank, uh, completely independent of all the political parties. Uh, Lord Wilson is one of our trustees and has very kindly agreed to sponsor this very generous prize. We also have a brilliant uh, group of people who will be uh, judging the entries uh, from all across Europe. Um, you're going to hear from uh, two of them uh, this evening. Uh, firstly, the chairman, Derek Scott, and then Professor Charles Goodhart, and they can um, explain what their role will be in it. The big 24,000 uh, question, or rather in this case, a uh, quarter of a million pound sterling question, uh, is if member states leave the Economic and Monetary Union, what is the best way for the economic process to be managed to provide the soundest foundation for the future growth and prosperity of the current membership. So quite an open-ended question. Uh, it doesn't um, tell you, you know, which countries might leave uh, the Eurozone or uh, why. Uh, it leaves all those things up to your imagination and um, also opens up a lot of other different sub-questions, some of which we've, we've, we've put down in the um, uh, prize rules in the pack so you'll have picked up on the way in. Now this, I should say, it's not an exhaustive list of questions, nor is it all inclusive. So please do feel free to consider other questions as well in your applications if you're making them. And uh, also do free if, if there are some of these questions that you don't feel like you want to explore in a huge depth then, and want to concentrate on others, then that's fine by us too. But just to run through them quickly, um, some of the questions uh, here are very obvious. So the first one is really about um, which countries should be in which currency block, as you know from, from the public discussion, which is already underway. Uh, some people have talked about Greece leaving, there's lots of speculation about that. Others have said, well, of course, if that happens, you'll really have a number of countries might fall out. You would have southern European countries like Italy and Portugal also falling out. Some people have talked about a northern and southern Europe that's been discussed in the FT. Uh, so really, we're, we're uh, leaving it up to you to talk about what you think an optimum monetary reconfiguration might be. Uh, one, of the, one of the thoughts behind the Wilson Prize is really to, to look in a lot more depth at this question of Euro exit, because it's often discussed in a uh, sort of political way or in a kind of rather um, superficial way. Um, but actually, once you start to think about what it would mean in practice, the complexities um, are really quite staggering. So one of the things we've encouraged people to, to think about now is these are the implications for sovereign debt, private savings and domestic mortgages. What happens to your uh, euro denominated mortgage if you are in a country that moves over out of the euro into a new, a new currency. What are the implications for international contracts that are currently denominated in euros you know, between a, a leaving member state or a group of member states, those are still in, those who are in the rest of the world. What would be the effect on the stability of the banking system? <coughs> Obviously, intimately all these questions tied up with the questions of banking sector stability, other questions like um, default on uh, central government debts. Of course, if you, uh, you know, leave, devalue very radically against the rest of the world, suddenly all your debt problems are even worse than they are before, unless you are also um, doing some quite radical things in terms of devaluation, uh, sorry, in terms of defaults. Approaches to transition, this is a very open ended question. Uh, so, when there have been previous breakups of monetary unions or currency pegs, you know, some of them have been signalled in advance and managed, uh, and some of them have been done very quickly with the element of surprise. One of the classic things that people have often thought about when they think about this question of member states leaving a currency union is, you know, if you signal that you're going to do this, won't everyone put all their money in other member states to avoid any devaluation <coughs> or any uh, default on your debts? So what, what is the right approach to transition? A, you know, very important question. 
and also the, the institutional implications of all these different big questions. So as I say, not an exhaustive list, though even those should keep you uh, busy. Um, key dates for the prize. Um, 31st of January uh, next year is when you've got to have your submissions in. Um, the, there will then be a kind of filtering process of um, all of the entries. Um, a, a, a short list will be drawn up and we will be making an announcement to the people who are on the short list on the 6th of March next year. Um, the judges will be getting um, a short list of entries which they will be judging blind. There won't be names on them, so they will be seeing an entry without knowing who has put it in. And we're aiming to announce the winner on the 27th of March next year. So quite a, quite a tight timetable for all of you, but I know that a lot of people have already expressed interest, a lot of people uh, are already working on their, their entries. In terms of uh, further questions, you can submit them to us at Pulse Exchange via the email address at the top of this slide. Uh, postal submissions, we've asked people to give us postal submissions, uh, are sent to that address at Pulse Exchange, 10 stories gate. And if you'd like to uh, review this event uh, tomorrow, uh, there was a question perhaps that you uh, sort of half caught or didn't, uh, would like to listen to again, this event is currently being filmed and will be up on the web um, from tomorrow. So, uh, without any further ado, I'm going to ask uh, the chairman of the Wolfson Economic Prize, the chairman of the judges, to say a few words about his role in the bank, perhaps also about the current state of play in Europe. It's certainly, uh, certainly, certainly a topical moment to be having this conversation. So, uh, it's great that so many people have made it here this evening. And over to you, Derek. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, and I think it is appropriate that we're in a, a law firm because clearly the issues that are going to be addressed are uh, as much legal uh, as they are economic in some extent. Um, now I think um, there was some suggestion that uh, uh, this prize might be too late uh, the way it looked a few weeks ago uh, and perhaps we should say that probably on balance you think that things will last until the end of March but they may not uh, but um, if one country were to come out uh, then we would still continue with the, with the prize. So don't feel that um, if, if uh, developments some, suddenly speed up that somehow any work is, uh, is wasted. And I do hope you will all uh, enter yourselves and encourage others to enter because I think one of the things that strikes me about this, this whole mess and indeed the whole uh, world uh, seen since 2007, 2008 uh, has been the extent to which broadly speaking the economic establishment when we put it that way, uh, has got it hopelessly wrong, both by what happened in the United States and also what happened here. I mean, there are obviously exceptions to that, uh, but I think broadly speaking it is true, and it's reflected in a lot of the so-called commentariat, uh, whether it's in uh, the newspapers or in investment banks or, or on the BBC, if I may put it that way. And I think one of the striking things, to me at least, is that there is... Uh, still quite a large misunderstanding, in my view, about what the nature of this crisis is about in Europe. Uh, it's presented in terms of being uh, one that centers on debts and, and deficits. Uh, they are dire, obviously. Uh, we know that countries lied about the figures before the thing was set up. Uh, but primarily, this uh, is not about debts and deficits. It's what happens when countries lose competitiveness to the extent that they have lost competitiveness within a monetary union. Uh, and as Mervyn King pointed out um, some time ago, and he said he does understand the nature of this problem, the sovereign debt crisis and the banking crisis are symptoms of the EMU crisis. And to that extent, uh, EMU is the problem, and the problem is EMU. And I think, touching on uh, what's happened over the last, uh, last weekend, uh, it's interesting that uh, there's a lot of comment about how uh, the British uh, are being isolated. The old story about Continent, continent cut off and so on. Uh, but this is predicated on the new institutions and new arrangements holding together. And it seems to me very unlikely, they may last till March, but it seems to me very unlikely that will be the case uh, because they do not really, any of the solutions being put forward, do not address this problem of how to remedy competitiveness when you can't depreciate your currency. And indeed, insofar as there are any recommendations coming out of the summit, for more austerity, uh, more enforcement of that austerity, though it's a bit unclear how you're going to do that uh, in the absence of a new role for the European Army. Uh, but insofar as that you have austerity and more discipline, uh, then it will simply, in my view, make it worse. So I do feel 
uh, that uh, before too long, perhaps the British will be less isolated than they appear at the moment, because fundamentally the only way this thing, in my view, can be held together is either by destroying European democracy or wrecking Germany. Uh, because, the, in effect, if the ECB were to buy up a whole lot of Spanish and Italian and other bonds, um, then if they did that in a way that would weaken the euro significantly enough to help Italy, let alone the Spanish and the other countries, to regain their competitiveness, uh, then inflation, obviously, in Germany would accelerate to totally unacceptable levels. And in economic terms, I would argue, and in a sense, I'm doing the easy bit, it's how we got into the mess, I don't know how we're going to get out of it. Uh, in economic terms, the only way out of this would really be for transfers from the current account surplus countries, in effect Germany, uh, to the deficit countries to obviate the need for them to try to restore their competitiveness through unacceptable and self-defeating deflation. Now, we can talk about the scale of that, but Roughly speaking, it would be, uh, we've seen what's happened with uh, from uh, the transfers from West Germany to East Germany, <coughs> which I think run at about two or three trillion over the total. They're still running at six or 60 or 70 billion a year. And broadly speaking, probably if you're going to try and hold the euro together on this basis, it would require transfers of about 150 or 200 billion euros a year forever. So that's not going to happen either. So we may last till March. Um, but somewhere along the line we will break up and that's where you come in. And as I say, I think it's, uh, we're open to all kinds of ideas because, as I say, a lot of the economic establishment has, uh, has been pretty clueless on this. We're interested in ideas not just on, uh, on economics, um, but how, if this thing is to unravel, uh, how it will unravel in the least damaging way. I think whatever happens, it's not likely to be terribly benign. But my own feeling is that the longer it's gone, this goes on, the weaker economies become, the weaker the banking sector comes, and the more febrile the political environment. So it would be uh, a bit silly to say that the sooner it happens, the better, because it will be economic mayhem, potentially. But I think the longer it goes on, the bigger that mayhem. So you've got an enormous task. Um, I don't think anybody's going to pretend that uh, there's one answer to this. And what we're trying to in encourage uh, is, as Neil said, uh, an imaginative approach to a tremendously difficult problem uh, and probably the biggest problem uh, confronting not just Europe, uh, but the rest of the world. And I've got the privilege to chair the panel. Um, I, I thought um, about entering it initially, but I think the panel is a safer position to, to be in. Uh, and uh, one of the things we might do, uh, we're talking about, is when uh, we have uh, uh, the final result, uh, it may well be quite a, a sensible idea to uh, publish a number of the, uh, uh, the entrants, not necessarily uh, all the shortlist, but a, a collection of them, because I think one of the things we're trying to do clearly, or at least one hopes, uh, central banks and chancellors across the world are examining this. If, if they're not, uh, well, uh, we really do have a problem. But by definition, uh, most of their discussions have to be in private, with the exception of the obviously of the, the odd leak here and there. So what we're trying to do is encourage a, a more serious uh, assessment of the problems ahead, because as I say, it seems to me that with one or two notable exceptions, the great majority of the commentariat have got it hopelessly wrong. And I think uh, to that extent, there's, uh, the electorate here in the public opinion here is probably rather poorly served uh, by the analysis of this. So um, we hope we get lots of entrance from you so we can get the quality of the discussion rather better. Thank you very much. I'll hand over to Charles. Thank you very much, Derek. I'm not really going to say anything very different from what you've already said. Um, I'm after the latest summit, uh, which was, I think, a great disappointment uh, to all those who hoped for some solution and resolution to the European crisis. Uh, we seem to be between the devil in the form of grinding austerity for an interminable period uh, for the peripheral countries of Southern Europe on the one hand, and the deep blue sea of a disorderly restructuring, on the other hand, where the kind of uh, problems and failings and losses and defaults that might arise from a disorderly restructuring were, I think, very well captured in a, 
um, paper by article by William Buddha uh, in the FT about uh, three days ago or something. So it's all the more important to try and somehow find a route between the devil of austerity and falling output on the one hand and disorderly restructuring on the other. And the question that the uh, Wolfson Prize is asking you to find some answer to. And it's not an easy question. If it had been an easy question, like Derek's, um, I would have thought twice about uh, trying to answer it myself, uh, rather than being a judge of the answers that I hope that some of you may be able to come up with. Now, um, too often in uh, my profession, of macroeconomics. Um, the hard questions are actually ducked uh, by those doing the work, which is one of the reasons why I think we've been so unsuccessful. But we have the great advantage that the less successful macroeconomics are, the more people are prepared to listen to economists talking about the subject, which is something of a boom. Um, and to give you one example, um, and are the models in which central banks have been mostly working, and indeed ministries of finance, which are known as the technical jargon, which for those of you who don't need to know it, don't worry about it, or dynamic, stochastic, general equilibrium models, have almost without exception assumed away all financial problems. Under those models, there are no financial problems. There is no default. There is no need even for a banking system and all finance works perfectly, and everyone can borrow a lend at the riskless rate. Now, what could be further from today's reality, or the reality of the factors that really cause our countries to deviate fundamentally uh, from their equilibrium? There's always a rather nice joke, that I, I apologize if you've heard it, about um, the uh, uh, the chemist, the physicist, and the economist were dropped on a desert island uh, with a can which includes all the food and drink that they may need until they get rescued. But they don't have a can in there. So what happens is that the physicist tries to focus the sun's rays on the can with his, through his spectacles in the hopes of burning it, the can open. The chemist hunts for an acidic pond whereby the acid may eat into the can. And the economist simply says, let us assume that we have a can over there. <laughs> There's really rather too much of that in our world. And I don't think that we as judges, in this case, although we are economists, are going to be prepared to let you who are answering get away without answering the hard questions. And many of the hard questions, as Derek indicated earlier, and I entirely agree, include many of the legal issues. And there are a lot of very creepy legal issues uh, that are involved in this. Another thing is that you have to think about what happens to the existing contracts. And one of the purposes and results of the European project was to try and unify the European countries, so that there was and remains and is a huge cat's cradle of existing contracts denominated in euros between all the players, both within and between countries. And there is a major question of what happens to those questions if the monetary condition, to those contracts, if the monetary con uh, conditions uh, change, which is one of the areas where the legal issues come into their own. And this is all very different and much more complicated than the Argentinian crisis and the Argentinian measure, measures that were taken, uh, because they were much more isolated from the rest of the world, whereas all the European countries are much more integrated. And that integration itself causes problems when you were thinking about the best way of uh, bringing about uh, an, an orderly change uh, of the monetary uh, conditions. And if you get uh, the kind of change in the monetary conditions that may well be necessary, 
uh, to bring about the shift in competitiveness, which the chairman absolutely rightly uh, emphasized. This is going to bring about such a large change, whether it be through internal wage price changes and internal devaluation or revaluation, or by a change in the monetary condition, uh, some kind of change in the monetary system. This is going to bring about such a large change that will be major winners and losers. And how are you going to deal with the pressures that are going to come upon the losers, uh, particularly the losing financial institution, um, the losing banks? There isn't going to be a Pareto optimum in the sense that you can make somebody better off without making anybody worse. Whatever happens, in this kind of case, some banks are likely to lose so much that they may become potentially insolvent. And to protect, the attempt to protect them, which has been going on now, by trying to require that the banks should raise additional capital to raise their capital adequacy ratios, has the disadvantage um, that at a time when the markets are not key, to say the least, to invest in bank equity almost anywhere in Europe, of forcing the banks to try and meet the higher capital adequacy ratios by delevering, which was actually forcing the whole problem to become even worse than it was before. Now, one of the reasons why I have I went into macroeconomics and have enjoyed it so much throughout my life is it is so bad. We know so little about it. And it is such a complex system because of the interactions between people um, that it is, it is always possible for anyone, whether an economist or not, to do a lot better um, than those who have been trying to uh, run the system and the economists who have been pontificating about it. So if you're not an economist, um, don't think that this rules you out doesn't. Your ideas may be as good and very likely are as good uh, as any of those uh, who have been trying to study it because we haven't done very well uh, and we don't know very much. Uh, so uh, may you all have the very best of luck. Thank you. Well, we've got a little bit of time, so uh, if people have got any questions to any of us, any of us, um, please feel free. Yeah. Just, who will be? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Could you wait uh, for the microphone, please? Uh, just wondering. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm sorry. Uh, who will be drawing up the shortlist? And how long will the shortlist be? Okay, the, the, the shortlist will be filtered via policy exchange, and I will be involved as the chairman. And I think the idea is probably a shortlist for about was it ten or something like that, about, about about ten. So I can just see an opportunity for another good heart's law here, as much as as soon as we get the shortest together and all the opportunities uh, are all different ideas put forward, then they become useless because they become transparent, which is not my first observation. And the question that I really want to follow up on is that when we're in a situation uh, that something happens and you've awarded the prize to someone who um, didn't say that, and someone who wasn't on the shortlist did say that, and we are the a chance, so there's not this opportunity for the lawyers to get involved. Is there an opportunity for the person who got it right who wasn't on the shortlist to uh, come back and say, what well, is it the judge's decision? Uh, no, there's no opportunity for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyhow, we can never know whether they did get it right. And remember what Cho and I said about the French Revolution? It's far too early to tell whether it was a good idea or not. Thank you. Just a simple question. Will the scripts be anonymized when the judges read? Yes, they will. Uh, that was just, uh, so will you, will you ask us to submit them anonymized or submit them with our names? So they get the They'll be submitted to policy exchange with your, with your name, 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 name,
more than surprised. Yeah, yeah, we even have another, another file with your name. Yeah, but, but, but they, yeah, they, they will be the name of the body policy exchange, but the shortlist will, will, will not happen. So that's a different yeah. chance. Okay. Yeah, so what about charts? Charts are pretty identifiable. Charts are? Yeah. Yes. Well, I think I, I would not, I would advise you not to put your name or your company logo into each of the charts that you put in the document. Right. For that reason, that will make it hard for us to anonymize. But beyond that, I don't, I don't know if the judges will be able to guess exactly whose entry it is from a generic chart. I don't think. As, as a referee of many, of many anonymized articles, I can tell you that if you refer to your own writing. In, the, in a bibliography, if you have one, a lot of times, <laughs> that usually gives you away. <laughs> <laughs> so, I've never actually written a paper before, but I've read the paper that you've written, and I do feel somewhat intimidated at the um, thought of who this is going to be spread across. Um, Will the judges be able to exercise any discretion slash compassion over this <laughs> kind of consultation? Well, for, 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 for example, I mean, I, if I was to write this, I would use very few references other than perhaps some really basic oh, things like multiple that, I mean, Before Neil, that, that does not matter. I mean, as, as Charles emphasized, um, you know, whether you're an economist or whatever, and it, it, we will not be, <laughs> what I said, we will not be impressed necessarily by a whole string of academic references uh, to bits of work that um, may or may not be relevant. So don't, don't, I just emphasize what Charles do not worry about that side. In terms of the style, I think that Neil would. I'm really just adding to what's been said already, which is we are, the reason why we have a prize rather than just commissioning a group of um, economists to write something for us is that we believe in the prize process. We think that there are interesting ideas out there uh, that are not necessarily held by you know the top professors and the known authorities, uh, which is what Charles was just talking about. So, uh, absolutely, we were, we are interested in the quality and the originality of the ideas, as well as the you know the format. That's why there is no absolute flaw on the number of words. We've said that you mustn't be more than twenty-five thousand words, and we thought we'd be in a range fifteen to twenty-five. But you know, there's no there's no hard lower limit. So, if you've got good ideas, and we have said as well that. We may publish at the end of the process a range of uh, entries, even those that don't win, uh, because we think that this prize process is important and will bring out from lots of different people <laughs> lots of different interesting and important parts of the answer. So whether that's compassion or not, we'll be very, very... I'm just, I'm just, I'm just don't, 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 anger and being a victim. Don't, 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 don't be intimidated by, no. by any of that stuff. Would this also mean that all the questions have to be answered, or can you just no, I mean, as, as Neil said at the beginning, we, we have put forward some uh, things that you know, are, I think that, you know, people might want to cover, but as I said, it's not an exhaustive list. You don't have to cover all those, uh, and you don't have to cover um, the, the maybe <coughs> others not on this. So it's entirely up to you uh, what you cover and how, how you cover it. There's no, there's no, the judge is not going to go through a whole checklist of things this guy hasn't uh, covered, covered that. So, yeah. Um, I've come here simply because I saw a list on the news on Thursday. Um, I'm not an economist, I'm not a legal person, I've just done more of a job. Um, it worries me slightly that the gentleman who did talk about for yourself um, said that about the addressing of the legal issues. Um, I believe there are structural reforms that could sort out a lot of the economic problems, not just in Europe. Um, and I've argued them many times over many years, and this I felt was a chance to express them. But I would be writing an essay to you, not being able to produce charts, figures, legal references, anything like that. Will you accept that sort of presentation? Of course, yes. No, I mean, but, 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 and, and Charles was right to say that, that, that there are some legal issues there. So I'm but they're huge. Yeah, you know, they're economic. So. If you want to write something from your perspective, um, you, you'll be treated in the same way as anybody else, and the fact that you don't have legal references or economic references will not make a blind bit of difference. Well, it certainly went to me, and it went to Charles, and it went to the rest of the judges. Thank you. So, yeah. Am I right in assuming that it'll just be the 1,000 word submission that'll be read as part of the shortlisting process, or will 
everybody's whole submission be read in their entireties. We, we will, uh, I think some will only be read at the thousand level, more so interesting okay. ones. Uh, sorry, um, uh, the, the gentleman was asking about it. We've asked everybody to provide a, th a thousand word summary of their argument at the start of it. Um, in, in some cases, I think we will be able to uh, remove some entries, even just from reading that, if they are clearly not very good or on topic or so on. Uh, in other cases, we'll read the whole, the whole thing before, before taking it to the shortlist, so it's going to be a mix. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think the question is slightly different. Because will the shortlist, shortlist entries of the provider be in their entirety or just the executive summary? Oh, oh, no, 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 the, judge, the judges will be reading the entries in their entirety. Yes. So, yeah. uh, concerning the timing question, uh, I mean, I, I feel myself in a little bit of a dilemma here because uh, you know, March is quite a long way away and uh, as you said, there, there's, a desperate, um, uh, <laughs> there's a desperate need for decent ideas because there's a complete lack of uh, sensible ideas uh, floating around the media. So, uh, you know, if one has a, you know, a, a really good idea, uh, you know, one feels a little bit of um, a responsibility almost to try and put that out in the public, in the public whilst it might uh, have some influence over you know, the course of events in the next couple of months. So, you know, how, how would you, s how, how could you potentially deal with that, that, that issue? Well, I mean, if you, if you want to you know, write an article, say, in different terms uh, about this subject, yeah. fine, um, then you, you know, we're not judging you on the article, we're judging on the, the submission you, you put in. Um, so, uh, <laughs> you're not going to be precluded uh, from entering because you know, we've heard your views on the TV or you know, Jeff Rappel show or something. You know, so there's, no, there's no problem about that at all. Hello. Um, I'm thinking of um, putting on my CV that I've applied for that. Will you be able to... Uh, I'm thinking of putting on my CV that I've applied for this prize. Will you be able to give like a reference for this? <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to send all the entries to the European Commission? <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good question. We will be circulating not just a winning entry, uh, but a whole range of the most interesting entries to key policymakers all over Europe. So yes, it's yes. Okay. We, 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 well, I was asked when we launched this uh, by a French journalist whether this was a deliberate, this prize was a deliberate insult to Mr. Sarkozy. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Hope the mic works. Um, in, in your remarks, um, you <coughs> spoke of the need for some sort of comprehensive solution to the Euro's problems. Um, is that really what you're looking for, or will you entertain proposals for specific countries, always bearing in mind that the circumstances of specific countries vary? so that Greece is in one position, the small pigs are in another position, the big pigs are in a third position. Do you want answers to all of these questions, or some of them, or is it a cub all Well, I mean, if I, I mean, if I did use the word comprehensive, what I was meaning is that you're absolutely right, these countries are in different positions to some extent, but the, the fundamental problem of all of them is, is what happens to loss of competitiveness. That's what I was talking about now. But Neil will perhaps handle a bit of it on the other. Absolutely. I mean, I, I stressed at the, at the start that we did leave this open-ended for you to tell us what you, you think, um, in a sense, the optimum configuration is. I mean, one of the things I would say about this prize is, um, in posing these questions, we are not necessarily saying that this is a good thing for member states to leave. We are simply asking people to consider what should happen in the event that they do. So it's up to you whether you wanted to consider the case of a single country either leaving or being forced out, like in the case of Greece, is probably the most often discussed at the moment or whether you wanted to think about whether there was a, a, a better equilibrium for a group of countries that have left, or whether that would be in some ways better for a larger group of countries to leave than one on its own. But that, that choice is really up to you. We've left this as, as open-ended as possible. But again, you do need to be cognizant that if one is thinking about <coughs> the welfare of Europe as a whole, that what might be a good solution for one country might, through contagious mechanisms, have impacts in other countries, which anyone looking at one country should keep 
should really must keep in mind. So, j j just to follow up on that, if I may, what we're being invited to consider is the optimum solution for Europe as a whole, taken as a whole, over the medium term, rather than a quick exit for any particular country. I, I think, I mean, I think it's, 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 if you like, dealing with what you might say the initial short-term problem of one or more countries leaving, but at the same time we're also looking at the, opt the, the, most, the most optimum currency configuration for if you like the medium term, so it's, it's in a sense both. I'm going to get more marks if I actually increased uh, the ability of the UK. Uh, I mean, you know, A, we come out better off if we did this with Europe. Mm -hmm. I mean, I say the Euro, and then, but the UK would be better off. He was, writing, exactly, for that he, was, he was writing exactly what you want to write. Huh? He was right exactly what you want to write. Yeah, that's good enough. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a question about the question, actually, because it seems to me to be slightly ambiguous in a couple of places. Mm -hmm. First of all, you say if member states, the, the Economic and Monetary Union, are the member states you're referring to the ones that are currently members of the Euro? Yes. Not other European Union states? No. Okay. And secondly, um, you refer to um, future growth and prosperity of the current membership. Um, you're simply referring to the 17 who are currently members of that. Yeah. Do you want any consideration to be taken of the impact on the rest of the European Union? Uh, no, no as, the, as, the, as the question is on. And, 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 and if somebody exits, impact on them, because of course they would then no longer be current members. I tend to think that better, better entries have got to consider the impact on other countries as well, on the wider world, of course, because mm -hmm. you know, all of these countries have got a trade balances and debts and deficits against every other country in the world as well. So you will probably have to think about what happens to other countries beyond the, the 17. But the question we've asked is about what you do to maximize the welfare of the current 17 members. But of course, you'll have to think about the impact on other trading countries with them. Thank you. The European Central Bank is the one black box here. A lot, uh, lot of the data is publicized. Not many of the contracts are, are known. Um, there are new uh, policies that are put in place, like the swap lines with the dollar. Um, will you be able to provide a legal documentation to the European Central Bank and its agreements with the National Central Bank? So is it up to us to find out? It's up to you to get what you can. And quite clearly, some of these areas, I mean, the whole uh, law applying to uh, money is, is, is not at all clear cut, otherwise you know, lawyers would be out of business. So I mean, we're not, when, we, when we're saying that these issues are going to be cut, uh, covered, I mean, it, it does not mean that there is necessarily a right answer. There's, there's quite clearly the amb ambiguities about private sector contracts that are part of, <coughs> part of, the, part of the problem. Absolutely. I mean, one of the reasons, again, why we, why we went for the prize is our, our sense that we had a very, very important and big multifaceted problem. But in many of the, the different areas, in many of the different elements of that question, are incredibly underexplored. For example, some of the legal questions, you know, they've only ever been looked at by a tiny number of lawyers. So hence, hence the prize and hence the, um, the, the attempt to get lots of people digging in lots of different places. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that you see such a big turnout here this evening, which pretty, clearly proves the sort of economic point that financial incentives do work in terms of uh, getting yeah. people to do things. If they're large. Yeah. <laughs> So. Well, there is, you've made it quite clear that you're looking for the economically optimal solution to the problem at the end of the day, either one problem is the least welfare losses. Uh, there is the somewhat possible possibility that this optimal solution might actually be just keeping the euro area intact, possibly even expanding it potentially as bizarre as that might sound initially. Uh, obviously, if one was to liken EMU to a patient, uh, we are focusing here clearly on one particular cure, which may not be the right cure given the current circumstances, uh, since obviously there might be certain that the, uh, the diagnosis might be wrong, uh, as you pointed out initially. Uh, the causes might be different. So different causes, different diagnosis, uh, different cure. Uh, wasn't, wasn't would it make sense to potentially split the thing in two 
in case that there was an optimal in euro uh, no break up solution which by comparison with an exit solution might actually also make economic sense? Well, we, as I understand it, I mean, we have in the question made the assumption actually to get avoid, avoid the, you know, the politics of whether it is the right for a country to leave or, or not to leave. Uh, but what we, 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 we are, our starting point is that you know, one, one country does leave. I mean, that's where we go. Now, if you want to, as a result of that, come up with a solution that means that the rest of the euro stays together or expands, that's entirely up to you. But we have the question on the, uh, if you like, the trigger for uh, considering this is that one country at least leaves the euro. I think that's right. Yeah, I mean, the question you're raising is interesting, but we, we, we did want to narrow down to this less explored area of what happens if a member state does leave. And um, it may well be that in your analysis, you find, for example, that you think the welfare losses in the country leaving would be so catastrophic, this would be a very bad thing to happen. But what we're, we're sort of, in a sense, forcing you to think about with this question is what to do in the event that this, even if you think it's a bad idea, does happen. So if you say, I mean, we have, we have narrowed things down, so we're not, we are asking you to think about what will happen if, if countries do leave, rather than just should they leave or not, which has been uh, more widely discussed. It is in your right, since it makes a lot of sense to basically remove uncertainty from the market by giving one clear manual uh, of what's going to happen or what should happen if it happens. Uh, I was just basically make, trying to make certain that uh, you're not going to end up with a whole book and rather one, uh, one, one concise paper. And it is a conditional question. If one or more uh, member states should leave the Economic and Monetary Union, and that question has got to be answered subject to their conditioning and policies. If you're presented with two solutions, the first one that promotes the UK's national interest in the short term, but in the long term that promotes growth and stability, which would you prefer? This is not a question about what's in the interest of, of, the, of the UK. It's a question of, as Charles says, making the assumption that one or more countries leave, what is the best or the least ally configuration <coughs> for the existing Eurozone. Sorry, uh, again, I'm just trying to clarify the question. Um, it talks about member states. Presumably member states, you mean member states of the European Union? No, of the Eurozone. Of the Eurozone. So that would exclude yeah. us, for example. <laughs> well, then at the end it says, and the future growth and prosperity of the current membership of the Eurozone. Of the Eurozone. So it actually excludes the UK. It does. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, if you wanted to add something about the effects on the UK, the non-Eurozone members of the EU, and indeed the wider world, um, I think we would regard that as useful additional material. In the rules, if you look at the back of your pack, we have, we have raised the possibility that there may be uh, the judges may decide to award some additional prizes for particularly good runners up, but that's at the judges' discretion. So, so it's just a quick technical point because uh, my son pointed this out to me and said, Dad, that would be a good thing for you to do. And my wife then reminded me that I didn't have time to do it because we've got a wedding anniversary and we were going away for a long time. So when she got to bed, I wrote it um, and sent it to you, so you have it. Um, and it's slightly longer than an executive summary, so do you want me then to add an executive summary, or have you taken that to be my executive summary? Um, I, 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 I won't have seen it myself, so I can't really answer your question. But is, is it your intention that that's your, your full yeah. entry is quite short? short? Yeah, that's the solution, yes. It's right. fairly short, but it's um, um, three or four thousand words. We'll, we'll take a look with interest. I can't really say more than that. But question. we will be able to provide you with an executive I think, summary. I think that it, would, that. it would be helpful if you provided something less than a thousand words as well. Yeah, so, so that it's subject to what your wife said. It's a good point. You obviously mentioned that the intent is to have the least painful solution that it can be achieved 
my question is, which criteria do you select for that to be the least painful? Would you consider, for example, <coughs> social criteria, uh, or would you consider, for example, a, a solution that is the least painful for the financial system? Or uh, basically, which criteria do you consider on your least painful solution? I, 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 again, it's up to you. If you want to use a welfare criteria rather than a cash GDP sort of criteria or something like that, that's completely <coughs> up to you. It allow you to define welfare as you as you see fit, I think. And you can choose whichever discount rate for discounting future losses and gains that you like. <laughs> um, you mentioned competition, and um, the Eurozone is not known for its agreements, uh, looking at them. Uh, uh, what would happen in the event of uh, you um, come, uh, thinking that some solution that's come from this uh, competition is uh, the right solution and uh, <coughs> the Eurozone completely disagree with you and sort of throw it off the top of the Clifford Chance building or something after they will we still get the prize? <laughs> well, I mean, as I said, the, po the point I was making was about how to restore competitiveness within the monetary union you can't depreciate given I mean, that was the point I was making. Uh, I don't think we uh, anticipate that the European uh, Eurozone governments uh, are going to um, Wait, what we're saying, and uh, it will make note of what their reaction is, make no difference to awarding the prize. I don't think. You yeah, well, said sorry, hang on, so just a little bit about that. On your bullet point 15, you refer to the pre agreed evaluation criteria. Uh, are you able to give some uh, colour on what the 10 or what the criteria will be? give you some sense of how the judging process will work. Um, I mean, while there's an overall kind of qualitative judgment, uh, we've just said about, in this point 15, about how, how we're planning to handle, um, handle a kind of tie situation. And part of that is about um, getting the judges in advance to, to, to do some marks out of 10, so that if we do get to a tie situation, there is a way of re resolving that. And though I, I don't know whether we will need that, but that's just as a kind of fallback. And also to give you some sense of how we would approach a time. Can you actually say what the criteria will be? Um, we, had, we, had talk, we have talked about it a bit internally, but I think, I think it's for the judges to decide amongst themselves about you know, having, having got a sense, of, a sense of what sort of questions that people are going to be answering. And if you want to add anything more about that? Uh, well, we haven't had a chance, uh, all of us, to meet yet, so I think we're premature. And anyhow, our, our splendid chairman will no doubt think of the set of criteria, send it round to the other judges, and we will no doubt comment, and we will come to it. <coughs> we have not done so yet, so it is premature to ask us what the criteria might be, because we haven't yet decided uh, exactly what we will choose. But, the substance will clearly be a key criteria. Whether we, whether we think it's going to work. Right. If I'm very productive and I send in two solutions, is that possible? I, I, my advice would be to try to combine them into, uh, into a single document. <laughs> Any more, uh, maybe one more. I, I have a. I think decent solution already, but uh, should I team up or uh, how do you view the team? Is it good to have five or two people? You, you, can, you can do what we like. All we said, I think, is that there has to be one name that, it, under, whose, uh, under whose name one person under whose name goes in. And then if you've got a team of five and you win, it's up to you how do you define it. We should make it interesting so you can it. But you can certainly enter the team, I'm sure some people would. Thank you. Uh, will all the criteria in the packs actually be published on your website for people who haven't been able to attend tonight? Absolutely, they're already there. They're already there. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. 
Hello. Can I ask, um, when the prize is over, what you would like to do with the winning entry? Well, with, with the winning entry? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we'll certainly publish the winning entry. Maybe, as, as we said earlier, part of a, um, a book with more than more than do the winning winning entry, uh, and it will certainly obviously get a, a great deal of, of publicity. But the, the winner will, will certainly be, be, be published, and there'll be some great jamboree where he or she is presented with the prize. We, we have asked you in, in point twenty one of the rules. We have asked that you are available if if you do win, you need to be available for publicity purposes because there will be an event to, to celebrate the awarding of the prize. Gentlemen. Two things. One is, uh, I've heard all the questions clearly, but not the answers. Perhaps one of the mics can go there, that will help. Uh, second thing is, I would like to know what are the don'ts, what are the things one should not do while uh, formulating one's uh, sort of answer. Or, uh, I, I'm, my only feeling is that there is there's no don't, except I, I wouldn't use green ink. <laughs> uh, but other than that, I think you're, you're entirely free to do what, 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 what you want. I'm sorry about the answer. Uh, I don't know whether you've got any to more seriously challenging than that. <laughs> Mary, I mean, there is a rule in universities that if you're, you put your, your exam paper in, and your handwriting is so bad that nobody can read it, that you are required to come and read it out <laughs> so, um, I'm, frankly, if you can get it in typed or electronic, it's got to be in electronic It does, I'm afraid it does have to be in electronic form. It's got to be in electronic form, so that, that issue doesn't arise. Those green ink, I'm sorry. Sorry for the iconoclastic nature of this question, but the rules say that the entry has to be in English. Do Americans speak English? I mean, do I have to, I have to, 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 to actually, you know, make, make the English spelling of certain words? Oh, uh, do you care? You can spell okay. favor without a U and honor without a U. Labor. That's all I ask. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, obviously, you'll lose lots of points for doing that. <laughs> okay, well, um, Thank you all very much for coming. I hope we, you found this useful. And, and as Neil said, if there are any questions that you haven't heard the answer to or whatever occurred to you later, then just get to on to uh, policy exchange on the website. Uh, and thank, yeah, thank you for coming. Uh, and there are some drinks next door uh, where you're very welcome. And we're going around. So have a good Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you.